Investors Chronicle. Thursday, 24th of November, and another Companies uh, Markets podcast coming back after a... Uh, an unplanned week off, but uh, we're happy to be back here. And we are happy to have Alex Newman back in the chair, back after uh, Checks Notes having a baby. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Good Welcome to be back. Yeah, it's good to have you back. And uh, Mark Robinson, you've not had anything, but good to have you back as well. Uh, no, I look like I'm expecting, but uh, no, no such luck. <laughs> and uh, Dan Jones, as normal. Hello, Dan. Hi, hi, John. Good to be here. What's uh, what's coming up today? Yeah, so uh, three segments as usual, quite thematically resonant this week. Uh, we start with Burberry. Uh, its results last week, but we're going to be talking about uh, the company's progress and the new chief executive's plans. Then, getting a bit more seasonal, we are turning to the US this week on the cover is our US special. It's Thanksgiving today as we record this, but that's just coincidental. Our US special looking at uh, a few companies thrown up by our quality shares screen when we direct its attentions to uh, the US market. So we'll be talking about that. And finally, of course, it is also the World Cup at the moment. So we are seamlessly going to talk about football and investing in football clubs. The, uh, the hook there being... Uh, the fact that Man United, one of the rare listed clubs, is uh, potentially up for sale. So we will be delving into that and to the wisdom or otherwise of of looking at these companies as investments. Lovely. Very thematic, as you say. Um, and before then, as normal, a very quick news roundup uh, of what's been going on this week. Uh, now, we won't go back over the Chancellor's autumn statement from last week, but if you missed that the uh, I don't know how you could, but the details are on the most austere tax and spending measures since 2010. We've got all the analysis you need uh, online and uh, yeah, everywhere I see. Um, yeah, as I say, a little bit of a quieter one this week, but still plenty of companies to update you on. Uh, first up, news this week: another investigation into fast fashion retailer Boohoo has found more evidence of poor treatment of workers. The Times put an undercover worker into a Boohoo warehouse in Lancashire who reported he would walk 13 miles to a shift in temperatures of over 30 degrees at times, all while monitored by a device strapped to his wrist. Uh, In 2018, the FT reported Boohoo suppliers were paying £5 an hour as their top wage. Uh, So more of the same there. And Boohoo shares uh, were off 2% on Wednesday as a result, and they are down now 68% this year. An unnamed North Sea operator is under investigation for flaring, the burning of natural gas and venting, releasing gas into the atmosphere by the North Sea Transition Authority, which is responsible for permitting. They have said that the investigation could result in, quote, action being taken, including a fine or the relevant licence being taken away. Legal services firm Knights has attempted to reassure shareholders that trading is back on track after a profit warning earlier this year caused shares to tumble by 45%. In a trading update for the six months to 31st of October, Knights said adjusted profit before tax had risen by 18% to £9 million. And news has come in this morning as we record that Twitter disbanded. Twitter has disbanded its entire Brussels office. While small, the Brussels office was seen as a key conduit to European policymakers and has sparked concern among EU officials about whether the social media platform will abide by the bloc's stringent new rules on policing online content. Elsewhere, Bill Ackman, the billionaire hedge fund manager and founder of Pershing Square Capital Management, has revealed he's shorting the Hong Kong dollar, arguing it's only a matter of time before the currency's peg to the US dollar breaks. And, well, I've written about Manchester United as well, but you're going to cover that. So I won't say it. Uh, That's all from me, Dan. Back to you and the rest of the show. Thanks, John. So, yes, we will begin with Burberry and the third quarter earnings season for consumer discretionary stocks in general. Uh, Burberry, you know, is slightly different to set the scene somewhat from uh, some of the European peers, LVMH, uh, companies like that, insofar as it's been a bit of a, a laggard in, in recent years, 
uh, its margins are lower, uh, and so on and so forth. There's also a bit of a, a turnaround needing to happen there with the arrival of a new chief exec. Nonetheless, its results uh, out last week, as we say, were uh, fairly decent, helped by a weak pound. Uh, and this seems like a sector, uh, Alex and Mark, uh, consumer discretionary is another sector where, you know, it's a case of so far so good. Earnings uh, in recent weeks have been strong. Uh, this is another, again, another sector where perhaps it could be seen as recession resistant. Alternatively, you might say if you're a bit more bearish that it's still too soon to say, you know, whether these uh, even better off consumers, you know, able to buy these kind of goods, whether they will continue to do so in the same volumes and in the same number uh, as economic difficulties brought to bear. So, Alex, maybe we'll start with you. What's your thought on Burberry, consumer discretionary in general? How do you sort of view that that sector at the moment? Yeah, I mean, so you sort of spell out quite well there. It's, when you compare it to, compare the company to someone like LVMH or Hermes, you're kind of, you're, you're almost bifurcating or separating the luxury tiers within the luxury category. So, mm. you know, someone like, a company like Hermes, um, you know the price point there that some of their lines are at, and some of their their markets are so so exclusive, so high end that you know comparing you know comparing your, your sort of the margins of Burberry to to them, it's sort of you're, you're not really it's not even really in the same category. Um, so Burberry, I mean, sort of seen probably slightly slightly lower down the the in 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 the high end luxury tier, even though you know the the, the goods they sell are, um, you know, very expensive and, and they're kind of work, operating in pretty rarefied air in terms of the retail sector. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it, it was, it's possibly too soon to say. I mean, Chris, Chris, uh, I think, you know, who Chris Akers, who, who wrote up the results this week, kind of uh, kind of said they were slightly less eye catching than some some others in the consumer consumer discretionary space have been have been showing in recent weeks and that's probably fair um burberry you know one of the concerns in recent years has been its exposure or its kind of perennial exposure to to asia pacific markets and the strength of the tourist uh trade there um you know obviously in china we have you know got continual concerns about um consumers there and the effect of interminable covid zero policies on um on trading um but yeah i mean the, the new ceo is 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 pushing ahead and thinks that four billion pounds of annual annual sales is is um is doable um and i think you know there's there's quite there's quite a lot in this franchise um that that could be expanded um Oh, there are opportunities for expansion, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, when the, the shares were trading quite quite lowly earlier this year, it, it's interesting. I was just looking back; they one of one of the companies that was screened by in March are high yield, i.e., cheap, um, uh, low risk uh, screen, mm. and they're up something like twenty percent on a total return basis since then, and I think since the lows this year, forty percent. So there's definitely been this kind of relief rally and expectations that things were not quite as bad as they seemed at the beginning of this year obviously there's a currency element um as well to their sales which has been good when the pound has been so weak um where things go from here i think it's quite, quite a tough tough call um but i mean the you know setting setting out clear targets like that albeit pushed out five years um gives gives a kind of a direction and a narrative to um the burberry investment case which um I think may have been lacking a little bit at points in the last couple of years. I, th I think what you mentioned before is uh, correct as well, because it's certainly not in the same category as, say, um, uh, Louis Vuitton. Um, and in fact, about 10 to 15 years ago, I seem to recall that they had a real image problem as well. The image problem being is that they'd lost their exclusivity, really, and it became became seen as just a normal uh, consumer brand. Plus, there was an awful lot of uh, hooky gear on the market as well. So everyone was sort of wearing their uh, trademark check at one point too. So I, I guess you, you need to go a little bit more granular looking at the breakup of their sales because, you know, aspects like, you know, consumer credit is increasing or continue to increase for a while. 
that may have more of an impact on a company. Uh, well, it wouldn't have as much of an impact on a company like Louis Vuitton because, you know, if you're willing to pay twelve thousand uh, pounds for a for a hold all, you know, an eight percent inflation rise or you know an increase in consumer credit is isn't going to worry you that much so the orthodox view i think the further you go up the value chain uh, the greater the resilience even during inflationary periods there's one other point as well because on, on the weekend i happen to be buying some um, high-end trainers for my uh, goddaughter and i got to uh, talking to a young chap in there who, who's he told me he had something like 300 pairs of uh, nike sneakers that none of which that he's actually actually ever worn but he says they they fall into the category now uh alongside things like rolex watches and of course we're saying here uh, luxury goods as well that people are buying them increasingly uh from an investment perspective t too which sort of underpins the market there and i, I thought that was interesting and i think it's in a, a general way it's a it's a, a ref reflection or a, a symptom of all the loose monetary policy that we've had over the last uh, 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trainers are definitely for for some people, not for me. I tend to wear the same pair until they uh, wear through the heels, but uh, they're definitely a, a luxury good and, and something they yeah, had to, to keep in the box in their hundreds, as you as you say, which uh, yeah. seems unusual to us, but th that is a, a, a recognisable trend. Um, Burberry itself, um, it was a good point you made, Alex, about setting clear targets you know albeit a few years down the line because that is you know some the lack of such targets can be a bugbear for for investors sometimes so it's a good starting point and i think as chris mentioned in his piece that that four billion target over the next three to five years it is uh, ahead of where analyst consensus was which was i think 2028 so you know you know they are they are uh, uh setting themselves uh, a decent bar to to hurdle but let's um let's go a little bit more granular as you said mark um one thing that was quite interesting, which again Chris picks out, was uh, the break, the breakdown regionally of sales and where they're happening. And Burberry's CFO said on analyst call, uh, I mean, we've spoken about how the weak pound over the summer had helped their results. They're actually, um, although they're to the end of September, they're interim results for six months. But uh, the weak pound, uh, you know, we've also discussed it in the context of, well, this should help people in terms of coming to the UK, tourists to be keen to take advantage of the sales there. What Burberry CFO said was that actually US tourists have been heading to Milan and Paris rather than London, which uh, uh, she described as really, really disappointing. Obviously, um, Burberry does have uh, continental European revenues, so it's uh, not quite as disappointing as it could have been because their continental European business really flourished over the six months UK was a bit more in line, but I suppose it's just a reminder that, you know, sterling's been weak, but the euro has been weak against the dollar as well. Everything has been until the last few weeks. So, uh, you know, these tourists aren't necessarily going to flock to London to to take advantage. And, and you know, Europe is a, is a beneficiary uh, perhaps more than the UK, certainly as far as Burberry has been concerned. Uh, the other thing regionally was that US, the US itself was you know, not, not a particularly bright spot either over these, this six-month period. Um, Burberry's also spoken about, you know, Chinese tourists spending a lot more in-country than, than overseas. So, so I wonder if that's something we need to watch going forward, that breakdown and spending and how, you know, insofar as it could be easy to think that the spending is slowing down. In fact, perhaps it's just being reallocated different, to different areas. I mean, it, it might be worth uh, watching uh, the US, uh, not only for this, but for another uh, a number of other reasons too, because they tightened up their their central bank policy before most of their competitors. So logic kind of dictates that they'll be the first to exit that as well. And, um, and you know, we could see improvements in uh, consumer sentiment as a result. Although, you know, trying to second guess uh, the global economy at the moment is, is a fool's errand, I think. Yeah. Just to, uh, I suppose, relate it back to the UK, the other thing that, that I think the CFO was complaining about was the reversal of the tax-free shopping plans for tourists in the UK, which was, um, you know, one of those uh, one of those many uh, items that was dangled in September and then whisked away again the other week mm. in the autumn statement. So, yeah, I mean, given given no one's coming to London and uh, the loss of that, uh, that tax status is interesting they're refocusing on britishness as like the mm. you know but i mean that's the there's the core identity to burberry isn't it and you can sort of um you, you can sort of question the value of you know 
maybe that that pull but then they're talking to a very globalized audience um for whom you know british fashion culture is has yeah has enormous pedigree and associations which you know is the value that is the value of the brand isn't it yeah in theory you should be to sell britishness in in Paris and Milan yeah. as easy as you can do in London, but I suppose if you're a if you're a tourist, you probably want something more as a keepsake of where you are. So yeah. perhaps that's a, uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, a final uh, thought on Burberry before we move on. Um, uh, we we spoken we referred to the new chief exec a number of times, Jonathan Ackroyd, uh, and his plans. You know, could M and A be part of those plans? You know, the, there's uh, uh, mutterings uh, only in the press rather than. Uh, people in the know, I think, at the moment of, of you know, Burberry looking at something like Mulberry. Alternatively, mm-hmm. Burberry itself could be could be taken out, although the share price rally over the past uh, uh, six months, as Alex said, has made that 40% more expensive than, than it would have been. But but I wonder if that's something to, to bear in mind as well, whether M&A will form part of his strategy. Well, I think Mulberry struggled a few years ago, didn't they? Because they went up the value chain and uh, priced out their uh, their existing uh, customer base to a large extent. So uh, I don't know, it would be a, a fit, I suppose. But uh, again, it emphasizes that I think that Burberry are in a slightly different camp uh, to uh, other European luxury brands. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair assessment. We we have them uh, on a hold currently, which probably sums it up, but there's definitely a lot going on there. For now, though, let's move uh, across the Atlantic to the US. As I say, it is Thanksgiving today as we record, and we have our US special cover feature this week. Uh, the second time we've done this, picking up uh, where we left off last year, we've once again used uh, a US version of our quality screen to look for some quality shares from the US market. Uh, we won't go into detail on all of those. You can pick up the magazine to, to find out a bit more. Uh, but we will touch on a couple. But before that, Alex, uh, you as our resident stock screen expert, why don't you just say a little bit more about what uh, what that screen filters out, what it doesn't filter, how we sort of start looking for these companies? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it's what we've done basically is, is taken our high high quality screen, as you said, that we use normally on the UK market, and just applied it to the S and P five hundred. Um, which, uh, if we skip back to last year, we did um, we did with uh, in a piece that uh, readers might remember called Beyond the Fangs, where you know our starting point was we wanted to look for quality shares in what is an enormous, enormous equity market in the US and lots of companies which kind of fly beneath the radar that aren't the Twitters or, you know, uh, or Amazons, um, but have lots of hallmarks of, you know, the sort of things that that quality investors look for um, and just pick a few of those out. Um, Partly by dint of sterling's poor performance against the dollar, um, that portfolio of four stocks is actually up in the last year, which you can't say about many either screens that we've run this year or or you know general equity portfolios that's um nearing 10 percent on a total return basis which is quite good so that's outperformed the mm-hmm. s&p 500 in, in sterling terms and dollar terms i should say um but th- i mean the screen itself it's it's kind of it, it's quite a um i really like it as a, a screen so it's quite comprehensive in in the things it screens out and looks for so it, its starting point is to pick out um you know the companies which are kind of top performers in in things like free cash flow generation, their forecast earnings growth that they need to have good balance sheets so that they can afford interest payments. You know and that's all that's, that's rising for many companies, um, and that they've got a history of margin expansion. So companies which you know there's a bit of momentum there. They're on a uh, that they're, they're often in sectors where there's there's kind of a there's a growth story um not that the growth is necessarily explosive but that they're they have enough of, and we talk about a lot of this on on the podcast in the in the mag about um an economic moat which means that they're going to be able to maintain their 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 kind of market position and be profitable um in doing that so um so yeah we've pick, basically we've run the screen we picked out four uh, four companies again this year um which are a little bit bar one um i should say a bit bit more below the radar than um than most u.s businesses um 
and kind of pick through the, the valuation cases for there. So, yeah, you've got f- four four extra ideas this week in the magazine than the normal um, uh, two. Uh, so, yeah, that's the, that's the kind of backstory to everything. Yeah. And, Mark, you uh, have analysed the case for one of these four companies, uh, CSX, uh, yeah. railroad sector, which uh, has become... Uh, a bit more familiar to people this year again now that people are starting to recognise once more the merits of the likes of Warren Buffett, who's obviously a famous investor, not in CSX but in the sector. But, uh, but can you say a little bit more about the, the company and the, and the space and what you've what you've yeah, actually, uh, been analysing there? I, I thought it was very interesting actually, and it uh, it highlights the fact that these type of companies as well that you you need a certain percentage of these type of companies within your long-term portfolio too. Uh, Alex made the point there about uh, competitive moats, and it certainly applies in the case of uh, CSX, as it would with uh, any large-scale transportation network in the US. Uh, That's because, you know, they've got a a competitive edge because of the the high barriers to to entry. It's... uh, like like most utilities as well, there's there's a huge level of uh, sunk costs initially, and uh, cash flows once they start generating are going against a smaller percentage increase year on year. So that's that in itself is uh, you know a huge you know benefit for uh, those sort of companies, and, and plus the the rail sector in the US is. Uh, gradually consolidated over the years as well. I mean, when the, when it first started, there were dozens of different operators, and I think there's only maybe half a dozen large-scale uh, operators back in the market now. And so it's a very difficult sector to try and um, tr- try and squeeze into, almost impossible in a sense. And you, you mentioned Warren Buffett there before, but, uh, the, the, you know, the aforementioned Bill Ackman and Bill Gates uh, are also investors uh, in North American rail companies too. Um, there's a couple of other benefits uh, that are coming through due to uh, the energy transition and uh, our move towards net zero. Uh, that's because, as, as CSX said themselves, um, you know, we, we, they're going to see a, a growth in freight volumes, partly linked to the fact that it's a, it's a more environmentally friendly way of transporting uh, bulk goods across you know, continental USA. Um, so, as I said before, the you know, I, th- I think what they said that the freight railroads are three to four times more fuel efficient, and that's 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 a critical point as well. And presumably, they, they could sort of benefit from uh, inclusion in ESG mandates on, on that basis. Um, and they. <clears throat> Point I was making earlier about um, operating expenses as well. That's uh, now running at about sixty percent, whereas five years ago it was sixty-seven point four percent, according to that. So you can see that over time, and this is partly due to um, efficiency programs too, that um, cash flows and profitability will be boosted because you're seeing. Uh, you know, cost as a proportion of revenues fall, so it's you know it's not it's not what you'd call a, a, a sexy stock by any uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But as we're in, as given the global economy in the states in the moment, you can see that uh, companies like uh, CSX have their attractions. Yeah, I think obviously you know with any transportation there is a cyclical element there but but as you say there are, there are reasons to think there's a structural growth story too and um uh, i think there's also a self-help story here from what i've seen too from some analysts seem quite keen on the, the improvements that csx has been making to its own services and its its staffing uh, levels as well so which could could bear fruit next year even if the economy takes a little bit of a turn for the worse the other thing i suppose we should say with with railroads in general which i know you've uh, flagged in the past Alex is is debt levels obviously uh, uh, these are typically relatively indebted companies but that's not necessarily a a reason to to overlook them just but is something to be aware of in a time of higher rates and and what have you yeah totally not out of place with other sort of utility or infrastructure Mm -hmm. um, style uh, sectors that yeah, they're, they're highly indebted but that is in a way and yes it is a bit more of a worry now that that rates are you know are ticking up but in a way as a validation of the you know the longevity of 
of the business model and its and, and its defensiveness and yeah it's kind of pretty oligo oligopistic uh, in in the states in in the it's concentrated in just the hands of a few corporates um but yeah i mean it's it's it partly validates the the idea that they're they're not really going anywhere and um uh yeah we sort of talk about step changing technologies i mean this is railroads are now a very old technology but this is you know it it was one of the greatest leap forwards in uh you know in in economic history that we're able to move goods at such low costs across large distances i mean and it still is powering our economies today so um um so yeah it just goes to goes to show how enduring some some investment themes can be i mean i just say it's inevitable that companies like this are likely to hold um you know a, a large proportion of debt uh, in the article as well, I, I point out that I think it's a uh, 118% of shareholder funds at the moment. But S and P give them a decent uh, triple B plus credit rating, uh, and that's uh, on a stable basis as well. So I, I think I, I, it's a, it's another instance where we'll pay to drill down and just have a look at the terms of the debt too, um, and the, the conditions and covenants linked to it. But uh, it, was, it was interesting, actually, because, I mean, it's, it's rare that I've got to write about a company uh, in this particular sector. Um, so I, I might take a look at it myself. Yeah. Sadly, I, I can't find a way, given uh, CSX focuses on freight. I can't really find much of a way to crowbar in my recent uh, journeys on the uh, US rail system on my holiday last week. But they were uh, right. they were very enjoyable, too. So uh, I'm sure all <laughs> listeners are delighted to learn that. But let's... Uh, Let's move on. As I say, there are uh, four companies we, we've picked out uh, in the US this week. You can find more details on CSX and the others in the magazine. But uh, another story this week uh, in a World Cup week and indeed uh, tying things together nicely today, uh, Friday when this goes out, uh, England are playing the USA at football. And so that is a my seamless segue from the USA <laughs> to football and uh, Manchester United, which has been in the news this week. Uh, because of a possible sale of the club. Now, Man United is uh, listed in the US and it is held by a well-known manager, Nick Train, uh, who has backed it for a number of years. Uh, But despite the the current owners, the Glaziers' um, ability, as many fans will perhaps be known, to extract money from the club, it hasn't necessarily been a a great investment for uh, individual shareholders. So... um, even though this sale may go ahead and, you know, the club's fans may think uh, good times are on the roll again, I, th- I think probably it's a, a chance to talk about and uh, remind ourselves of, of perhaps the perils of, of, you know, investing with your heart rather than your head. Uh, Alex. Yeah, I mean, it's. I was just looking back at the... Um, I remember Stocks, Dow Jones used to track... they track listed football clubs... Um, uh, in in an index which they stopped actually unfortunately a couple of years ago it might be because there's there's actually relatively few listed clubs now um but i mean within the past you know the past 20 years there have been several clubs i mean rangers and celtic were both listed um obviously man united is probably the most high profile one borussia dortmund and juventus both uh both had their own listings uh, and it's interesting following that um that index because for much of the last decade um it performed very poorly and then actually in the run-up to the pandemic um the the index did start to perform uh a little bit uh, a little bit more strongly um th- than it had done and uh yeah i mean there's a number number of reasons for this i mean it, it, football clubs are a bad investment but they're also an incredibly weird investment because um because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of this, there's this, this, this market now for the elite football clubs, which um, is as much about status as about returns, and um, and and you know that that's why you've got these sort of like astronomical astronomical figures being quoted for for you know potential Man United sale of like six billion dollars, which is about, about double their current market value. Um, uh, but you know, football clubs because of this. Because they've become sort of less and less uh, 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 about returns, it's skewed the valuations, lots of the valuations within the sport or at the top of the sport. So specifically in terms of players' wages and signing valuations, 
it means balancing the books is a real challenge even before the immense you know operational overheads of sort of running stadiums and you know and marketing the the franchise in the sort of current parlance um uh, globally uh, is considered so you know you do very would do very very well to 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 make a return on on football investments looking back to since IPO the you know that man united is has du- has doubled since their the IPO in total return of total return basis but um it's a bit less impressive when you consider that's that's just about, about just under half of that return has probably been made in the last week as the news of their supposed sale um uh, has broken and you know it's, it's like a fifth of the S&P 500 over the same time so mm. so on comparative basis it's not been it's not been a stellar investment for Nick Train yeah I, I think yeah, he would certainly be hoping for some kind of big deal to go through and help him out there. Uh, so with Man United, of course, you know, the, the, since it's been listed, it's been going through a period of relative decline on the pitch. But yeah. the idea being that you know, it's, it, I think which Nick Train would say as well, it's got that you know that brand power and that ability to you know produce commercial revenues across the world. But but even that hasn't been enough to to save it. Um, I suppose another example with Juventus. Over the years, have been you know obviously incredibly successful Italian team, but its share prices, you know, really not really reflect that much at all. In fact, I think the only time it really got a material boost was boost was when they signed Ronaldo, and uh, uh, you know again the the commercial potential there was seen as um, uh, you know really putting a, a fire under the stock for a brief period, and, yeah. then, and then it reversed. So yeah, it's it's very difficult to to draw a line between even what you know about the commercial aspects of football and. Uh, share price performance but, you know and yet you know all the talk this week has been about how this is a seller's market for for football assets so we mm. you know we had the Chelsea sale over the summer there's two two and a half billion pounds that was uh, that's a record I think the the equity stake that was taken a couple of years back in Man City valued Man City at five billion dollars then uh, uh, Liverpool was on the you know supposedly on the uh, 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 on you know they're looking at a sale as well, and then all these numbers being floated around for for Man United. Um, I mean, I sort of just kind of uh, going back to what I was saying before. I mean, you know, in the middle of a World World Cup, why it might be the case that despite their questionable um, conventional or financial fund, uh, you know, returns based on a on a fundamental basis. Um, uh, that why that one might still be questionable, but it could still be a seller's market. I mean, you just look at the World Cup. Um, you know, it's being hosted by a tiny nation with zero historical pedigree in the sport, but it just ha- so happens to be able to afford the two hundred twenty billion dollars or whatever it is it's apparently spent on infrastructure to to host you know a, a month long um, event. So, but why it might have done that, and why you know you've got oligarchs or billionaires who are prepared to pay up without a prospect of sort of direct financial return from the club it's the clubs themselves um is that it's you know unquestionably elevated qatar's global profile that probably the case for saudi arabia with their their you know they're buying um newcastle it has been the case for abu dhabi with man city psg so there's this kind of like it very intangible commercial soft power edge that is to be gained by inserting yourself into the conversation about the world's most popular sport um you know, but where shareholders, ordinary shareholders, stand in all of that, and if you're thinking, "Wow, Man United stock," we've, we've been with, you know, they're talking about six billion dollar valuations, and this is, you know, the market value is only three billion dollars. You're, you're kind of, you're, you're making a bet on the valuation on something which is so intangible and ephemeral, which is the, you know, the kind of whims of billionaires and nation states to, to to buy these trophy assets so it's not a, it's not an easy valuation case to make and just to return to the point you, you made at the top you know you can get carried away as a fan you know if, if to see the investment case beyond the the reality of making money from a football club but equally you know the speculative investor i think here can can potentially potentially get carried away with thinking about the valuations that are being talked up so yeah it's not we talk a lot about intangibles but these are Possibly the really intangible yeah, exactly. intangibles there. It's not the the good kind of intangibles, and in Man United's case, you don't even get voting rights with the, the yeah. Either. So, uh, but there we are. Uh, that uh, story will develop in the background, and uh, 
perhaps to shareholders' advantage and to Nick's, Nick Train's advantage, uh, but that is still to be decided, of course. We, however, have run out of time this week, so thank you to Alex and to Mark and to John as ever, and thank you to you for listening. We'll see you next time on another Companies and Market Show.